Hi everyone, my name is Hala Mahmoud. I'm a second year medical student. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, I'm really excited to be giving you guys this spell session. This is my first ever PAL and I hope you all benefit inshallah. Uh, I know unfortunately this is pre-recorded, but if you have any questions at all, please do not hesitate to contact me. You can send me anytime an email or an WhatsApp. I put my information here and in the final slide as well. So this is how I'm going to be explaining inshallah. I'll have my own slides or notes to explain the concept, and then I'll move to the doctor's slides. So I'll try to quiz you on that. I'll cover the answer, and I want you guys to try to test yourself and stay active throughout the session. And in the end, I'll try to come back to this slide if there's enough time, and it will be like a quick recap of the whole lecture. Okay, so without further delay, let's start. Bismillah. These are the objectives. Um, I'm going to start by describing hypothalamus. All right. So we have a small but very important region in our brain known as the hypothalamus. It's located below the thalamus and above the pituitary gland. And this hypothalamus contains a bunch of nuclei, which is a collection of cell bodies or um, the cell bodies of neurons. So you know how a neuron has, or a nerve cell has three components, dendrites, cell bodies, and axons, right? So the nuclei or the nucleus is a collection of a bunch of cell bodies that work together uh, for a certain function. So the two nuclei that we're going to be focusing on today are the ventrolateral and the ventromedial nuclei. So this is a picture of the, uh, can you see the first one? Okay, so this is a picture of the nuclei of the hypothalamus. As you can see, they are collections of cell bodies and they work together for a certain function. The one that we're going to focus on is the ventromedial and the ventrolateral, it's not on the picture right now. And on, right underneath the hypothalamus, you'll find the pituitary gland, and above it, you'll have the thalamus. All right, so what do these nuclei do? The ventromedial nucleus is important for uh, telling us that we're full. So we said that the nucleus has cell bodies with a common function, right? What's the function here? It's to make us feel full or satiated which means satisfied, so that we could stop eating. Meanwhile, the ventrolateral nucleus is important to make us feel hungry, so that we can eat something. A way I use to remember this, uh, you don't have to use it if it doesn't help, but remember that medial, it's as if you're saying something is in the middle, right? So when something is in the middle, it's like you're satisfied with it. It's not too extreme, right? You wanna be right in the middle, like moderate. Remember medial, is satisfied or satiated or basically full. So remember ventromedial nucleus. Meanwhile, if you're in the extremes, if you're lateral, then it's ventrolateral. So you'll feel hungry and not satisfied. You'll want to eat more. And uh, hyperphagia just means excessive eating. So phage means eat. And fasting means you don't eat. So what happens when we don't stimulate them? So previously we talked about what happens when you stimulate these nuclei. Now, what if you inhibit them or destroy them? Um, if you destroy the ventromedial nucleus, you will not feel satiated or full, and therefore you will eat. And for the ventrolateral nucleus, if you destroy the ventrolateral nucleus, you will not feel hungry, and therefore you will fast, you won't eat. So basically just do the opposite of their function. Okay, so now I'm going to test you. What happens when you stimulate the ventrolateral nucleus? and destroy it, and same for ventral medium. Try to fill in the blanks. So again, when we stimulate the ventrolateral nucleus, we will eat more, we'll have excessive eating hyperphagia. When we destroy it, we'll have fasting, and the opposite here. And here, orexigenic means uh, stimulate appetite, and anorexigenic means you suppress appetite. Like we've talked about the effects of stimulating the satiety center, the place in our brain that tells us that we're full. But how do we actually do that? How do we stimulate it uh, to let it know that we have eaten already? The number, number one, the first way is when we eat, our stomach expands, right? So it distends or stretches. And this stretching stimulates stretch receptors that are found in the walls of our stomach. And these signals get transmitted by the vagus nerve to go to the satiety center and tell our brain that we don't need to eat anymore. 
So that's the first way, extension of stomach. The second way is when we have food in the duodenum. So after you eat, when the food reaches the duodenum, the, duod the duodenum will sense that there is food there. So it's going to release a certain hormone known as cholecystokine. So that's the first hormone. The second hormone is released by the uh, lower intestines. So this is by the duodenum. This one's by the lower intestines. It's called peptide YY. So both of these hormones lead to the stimulation of the vagus nerve as well. And again, it will uh, tell the satiety center that halos, we have eaten, we don't need to eat anymore. So therefore you will stop eating. And finally, the last way is through the absorption of nutrients. So when we eat, we absorb some nutrients, right? They will go through the stomach, and, sorry, through the intestines into our blood and we'll have fatty acids, amino acids, and uh, carbohydrates. And these nutrients will be elevated in our blood now. So they get, they become detected by the satiety center. And um, when the satiety center is stimulated, again, we don't eat anymore. So these are all the three different ways that we can stimulate the satiety center. Okay, how do we stimulate the feeding center? How do we tell our body that we need to eat? So when we fast, our stomach releases the hormone called ghrelin which stimulates the feeding center or the ventrolateral nucleus of the hypothalamus. So therefore, we eat. And you can remember the name uh, ghrelin easily because it sounds like uh, grumbling. So you know how when you're hungry, your stomach makes a sound. But this is not actually um, a scientific relation between ghrelin and the grumbling sound. It's just to remember, it sounds similar to grumbling. So ghrelin equals grumbling, and you get hungry and you eat. these were both short term meaning they were directly after you eat so it's a short period of time this mechanism however is long term meaning it functions over an extended period of time like how does it work when someone accumulates high levels of adipose tissue it's not something that happens after one meal or one day right it's something that's long term so when you have high levels of adipose tissue what's going to happen is you will produce the hormone leptin so adipose tissue helps in the production of leptin and this leptin will inhibit the release or production of ghrelin. So you won't feel as hungry anymore and therefore you won't stimulate the feeding center and you won't eat as much. So this is our body trying to regulate its energy levels. Okay, now I'm going to test you. Um, let's try not to look down here because it's kind of uh, has the answers. Probably should cover this. Um, okay, so let's start with the first one here. What's the signal that's sent from the stomach that stimulates the satiety center and tells it that we've eaten already? The answer is gastric distension. Again, remember the stretch receptors send a sensory signal through the vagus nerve to the satiety center and also to the nucleus tractus solitarius. The nucleus tract, uh, tractus solitarius is just a group of nerve cells. So it's a nuclei, just like the ventromedial nucleus, but it's found in the brainstem rather than in the hypothalamus. So this is in the hypothalamus, this is in the brainstem. And it just helps in the integration of the signals and it works with other parts of the brain to accomplish the final goal of feeling full. Okay, so what was the, um, so that was the stomach. What about the intestine? What signal was sent? Remember when we said that the food enters the first part of the duodenum, what does the duodenum release? So if you said CCK or cholecystokinin, that's correct. And also peptide YY, it's released by the lower intestines because the stimulus is when the food reaches the duodenum. Now, what was the third thing that stimulates satiety that we said goes through our blood? Okay, if you said nutrients, then that's also correct because after we eat, we absorb nutrients like carbohydrates, amino acids, and fatty, uh, fatty acids. And when their levels rise, they're going to go and stimulate your satiety center. What was the thing that was for long-term control? And we said that it's released by adipose tissue that helps to inhibit ghrelin. You said leptin, that's also correct. And uh, finally, 
what was the hormone that the stomach releases in order to uh, stimulate feeding? The answer is ghrelin. So I hope everything makes sense so far. All right, so um, we talked about feeding. Now let's talk about the thirst center. The thirst center has osmoreceptors. So they're basically sensors that sense or um, they see the osmolality of your plasma. If your osmolality increases, then you will stimulate the thirst center. If your osmolality decreased, you're going to inhibit the thirst center. Um, before I continue, let me just explain what um, osmolality is. I know you probably all know, but just to make sure everything is clear. So osmolality, um, it's almost like a measure of concentration of the dissolved particles in fluid. So let's assume that the dissolved particle here is salt and the fluid is water. So here you have a very high concentration of the salt compared to the water. And here you have a very low concentration. So we would call this high osmolality and low osmolality here. So this is dilute, this is concentrated. Okay, so back to the previous slide. When you have a high osmolality or a high concentration, you're going to stimulate the thirst center, which makes sense. It's because as if you have a very low level of water in your body, so you want to raise that level of water, so you want to drink more. And same thing for extracellular volume. Um, let's say someone had an injury and they lost a lot of blood. This is not good in terms of uh, CVP. You guys did CVP, and you know that if the blood volume decreases too much, you might have shock if your blood pressure is too low. So we want to raise up the blood pressure back again. And the way to do that is by increasing your volume, your blood volume. So how do we do that? By increasing the fluids, by drinking more. So that's why we need to stimulate the thirst center. And a decrease in osmolality will inhibit the thirst center because you have so much fluid. Let's go back to this picture. You have so much fluid in compared to the solutes, you don't need any more. So that way you're going to inhibit the thirst center. Okay, oh, I think I, I hope you didn't see that. Okay, so if plasma osmolality is high or low, it's going to stimulate the thirst center. The answer is high because we would want to bring it back down. We don't want the, the concentration to be too high and blood volume would be low and that would stimulate the thirst center. And something I didn't mention, but the plasma osmolality is the one that's most important for the thirst center stimulation. Okay, so now let's talk about mastication. What is mastication? It's just a fancy word for saying chewing. We have four muscles of mastication and all of them attached to the mandible. And this is the mandible. It's basically the lower, lower jaw bone. Okay, so the first muscle is the temporalis muscle. And remember that it's around your temple area. It will be around here. The second muscle is the masseter muscle. And this is attached to the zygomatic bone. This is your zygomatic bone, basically your cheekbone. And then you have your medial pterygoid and lateral pterygoid. The primary job of all of these muscles is to open and close our mouths and move it side by side. And why is this important? So we can chew our food. Now, the temporalis and the lateral pterygoid are important for opening our mouth, and the masseter and the medial pterygoid are important for closing our mouth. And the way to remember this is remember the M and the M together. The M and M are always together. And remember that when you're trying to say the letter M, you have to close your mouth, right? So you can't say M uh, if your lips are apart. If, uh, M and M, close the mouth. So masseter and medial pterygoid, close the mouth. While temporalis and lateral pterygoid, open the mouth. Okay, and obviously you know that um, mastication is voluntary, so chewing is voluntary. You can't be chewing while you're sleeping, for example. Um, but how does it occur? How do we chew? We have food in our mouth, and when this food enters our mouth, it increases the pressure in the oral cavity. And when there's an increase in pressure, it will trigger a reflex called the chewing reflex. So what is that reflex? Um, basically, it starts with the presence of the food bolus. It's basically like broken down uh, food. So when there's a high pressure and we have a food uh, bolus inside our mouth, our jaw will drop, our lower jaw will drop. So it's going to open and look like this. It's as if you want to accommodate as much food as you want, as, as much food as possible. So you open your mouth more. Then when the jaw drops, now the pressure is not as high anymore. So there's going to be a reflex contraction. So imagine as if the mouth can't feel the food anymore when it opens, 
So we'll have a reflex contraction. It's going to close. So it's going to go like a reflex. And the way you can imagine it, it's like a um, it's like a rubber band. So when you pull a rubber band and leave it, it's going to recoil and shrink back, right? So same thing for the muscle. So after you stretch the muscle when you open your jaw, when you open your mouth, it's going to have a reflex contraction and close back again. And the reflex just keeps repeating itself again and again until you uh, swallow the food. So it goes, it goes back and forth like this. Okay. So now I'm going to test you what happens to the pressure uh, for it to stimulate the chewing process. Does the pressure increase or decrease? The correct answer is increase because when there's food in the oral cavity, it will increase the pressure and it leads to the start of the reflex. And um, what were the jaw closing muscles? Remember the two M's? masseter and medial pterygoid. All right, so now let's talk about the stages of swallowing. So we're done with uh, mastication and chewing. Let's talk about swallowing. We have three stages. This is important. The oral, pharyngeal, and esophageal. So let's start with the oral. The first stage, you can call it oral, you can call it buccal. This stage is voluntary because we can control it. And uh, now the food will enter the oral cavity the bolus will get uh, squeezed or rolled posteriorly against the palate. So the palate is just the roof of the mouth and the food will go there and it will go towards the back. When it reaches the back of your throat or the back of your tongue, you can't stop swallowing. Even though it's voluntary at this stage, plus you've started the swallowing process. All right, now the second stage is the pharyngeal stage. Pharyngeal stage is involuntary, meaning you can't stop it at all. In this stage, you will push the food bolus uh, back, and when it reaches the posterior mouth and the pharyngeal wall, it will stimulate receptors. So you will get a reflex that initiates a bunch of muscle contractions. And we're going to describe each of these contractions in a second. Okay, so the soft palate, which is this part in red, it will go up and it will close the nos nasopharynx. So this is the nasopharynx. You don't want the food to go up backwards, right? So you're going to close it with this um, soft palate. And another thing that will happen is the palatopharyngeal folds. So these folds right here are going to narrow down and come together to squeeze the food down into the pharynx. So these are the palatopharyngeal folds or arches. And another thing that happens is your larynx, which is the tube that eventually leads to the lungs. So remember, L for lungs, L for larynx. For larynx, you don't want the food to go into your lungs or to be aspirated, right? So to prevent that, the larynx will be pulled upwards by the neck muscles. Obviously, it's not shown here, but basically it's moved upwards to um, move it away from the uh, passage of the food. And another thing is this epiglottis right here, this green thing it's going to fold over the laryngeal inlet, the passage that um, leads into the larynx. So this happens to stop the food from entering uh, into the larynx and have it move instead into the um, softness. So the food's going to hit the epiglottis and it won't find anywhere to go besides laterally. So when it goes laterally, it's going to find the esophagus or the food passage, and it's going to go down into the stomach from there. And finally, uh, the vocal cords. You know that the vocal cords uh, move when we are speaking. So now we're not going to speak or breathe while we're swallowing. So they're going to narrow or become approximated. So no breathing will occur. That's why they always say don't uh, talk while eating. Otherwise, the vocal cords will move and you might accidentally aspirate the food. Um, so yeah, so a recap, we have five things occurring. Number one, the soft palate, sorry. The soft palate will go up and close the nasal pharynx. Number two, the palatopharyngeal folds are going to narrow and form a very um, small slit to squeeze the food down. Uh, number three, the vocal cords will approximate, so no breathing will occur. Number four, the whole larynx will be moved upwards by the neck muscles. And finally, the epiglottis will swing to close the um, larynx. So the food will now go where? To the esophagus. 
So this is the esophageal stage. Um, this stage is also involuntary, so you can't stop it. Now the upper esophageal sphincter will relax and the pharynx will contract. Why? Because we want the food to enter the esophagus. And this phase, it's just the food going down to the esophagus. I'm going to go back again so you guys can see it. This is the oral phase. This is the esophageal phase, sorry, pharyngeal phase. And then we have the esophageal phase. So what are the three stages? Oral, pharyngeal, esophageal. Now, this is kind of the same thing we mentioned. Uh, deglutition is just another uh, word for swallowing. So remember, mastication is chewing, and deglutition is swallowing. Let's test ourselves. Uh, what is the thing that's pulled upwards and prevents the reflux of fluid into the nasal cavity? So it prevents it from going upward. It's the soft palate. Uh, what are the things that are pulled medially to approximate uh, to each other to form a slit? This is the one that had the picture on the side. He said palatopharyngeal folds, that's correct. And um, what's the thing that's pulled upward and then anteriorly by the neck muscles? The answer is larynx. And finally, um, what swings backward over the opening of the larynx? The answer is epigonus. All right. So what phase is this phase right here, A? You said voluntary or oral or buccal, they're all correct. What about B and C? It's the pharyngeal. And finally, the last one is the esophageal, which begins with the upper esophageal sphincter opening. Okay. So first of all, we know that a sphincter is usually a muscle that's like a ring that contracts to act like a valve to stop anything from moving back. So we don't want the food to move uh, from the stomach to the esophagus or from the esophagus to our oral cavity. We want it to go down only in one direction. So to do that, we have to have things like valves called sphincters. The esophagus has two sphincters, an upper esophageal sphincter and a lower esophageal sphincter. The upper esophageal sphincter is composed of two muscles, the inferior pharyngeal constrictor and the cricopharyngeal pharyngeus muscle. It makes sense um, that it's called inferior pharyngeal because it's at the end of the pharynx, so inferior pharyngeal. And the cricoid cartilage is here, so it also makes sense that there's a crico pharyngeus muscle. And they kind of sound similar, so I think that helps with memorization, IPC and CP. Okay, so normally they are always tonically contracting. That's why you can see these lines right here. They're always there meaning they always have a uh, tension or contraction, even when they're at rest, even when you're not swallowing. Why is that? Because you don't want air to enter the stomach. Otherwise, you might get bloated. So we don't want air to enter. That's why we have upper esophageal sphincter always contracting. However, when you are swallowing, the tonic contraction will release just for a bit. Just for a second, the upper esophageal sphincter will relax so that the bolus of the food um, can go from the pharynx into the esophagus, right? So it needs to open up a bit to allow it uh, or to give it space so that it can enter. Then after the tone increase, uh, decreases, sorry, so after the tone decreases and the food passes, the tone has to increase back up again. Because remember, we don't want the food to go um, opposite way and go up into the uh, mouth again. So if you follow the graph, you have tonic contraction it relaxes a bit and then it contracts back up again. And as you can see, it increases so much, even more than it initially was. And the reason for that is because we don't want reflux of food. So now it's not just air that we're trying to avoid. Uh, now we're trying to avoid food moving through it. Another point you need to remember is that the upper esophageal sphincter is a skeletal muscle. And the skeletal muscle is supplied by the vagus nerve. So at rest, you always have vagal tone, which maintains the closure of this sphinct. All right. Now, once the food bolus is in the upper esophageal sphincter and it enters the esophagus, we will have something known as peristalsis. And this is something that helps the food bolus to move down the esophagus. Uh, but if we, if we take the esophagus, we can split it into three parts. Okay, so we can split the esophagus into three different parts or three thirds. 
The upper one third is the skeletal muscle and the lower two thirds are smooth muscle. Now peristalsis happens in both parts. However, in the upper part, it is due, due to the uh, motor supply to skeletal muscle, by which nerve, remember we said the vagus nerve. But the lower two thirds, it is by the enteric nervous system, which is basically a network of neurons that are made specifically for the GI tract. So here, specifically from the enteric nervous system, we have two plexuses, the myenteric plexus and the myster plexus. And these two are the ones that help uh, in peristalsis for the smooth muscles. So vagus nerve and enteric nervous system, specifically these two plexuses. Okay, so what muscles lie in the first third and what type lie in the last two thirds? Striated or skeletal and smooth. Okay. All right, so we talked about the feeding center and the satiety center and the thirst center. Now we have something known as the swallowing center. Swallowing center lies in the medulla of the brainstem. So this is our brain. We have a uh, brainstem made up of three parts. And the part we're concerned about is this part right here, the medulla. Now in the medulla, we have a bunch of nuclei. Remember what we said nuclei is a collection of cell bodies with a shared function. So we're going to look at two specific nuclei, the dorsal motor nuclei and the nucleus ambiguous. The nucleus ambiguous is the one that is for the um, upper one third of the skeletal muscles. And the dorsal motor nuclei is the one for the um, second two thirds, which is for the smooth muscle base. So in the upper one third, Whenever food enters, we know that the vagus nerve is the one that's going to get stimulated. And then we'll have contraction of skeletal muscles, not smooth muscles. And this contraction will only occur above the food bolus. So you're going to have contraction above the food and push it down uh, gradually. However, in the second two thirds, when we have the smooth muscle, we'll have the uh, myenteric nerve plexus. And uh, in this case, we're not only going to have one neuron, we're going to have two. So in the vagus one, uh, for the vagus nerve, we're only going to have one neuron causing contraction. Because for the um, smooth muscle, we will have inhibitory neurons and excitatory neurons. And both of them are going to be used. What happens is that um, in the smooth muscle, just above the bolus, we'll have contraction. So we'll have excitatory neurons above it, causing contraction to push the food down. But then after the food bolus, so below the food, we're going to have inhibitory neurons causing relaxation. So it's like you're causing contraction above and relaxation below the food or widening below it. And this makes it even easier to have the process of peristalsis. Okay, now I'm going to test you. We said that we have two, um, we said that the swelling center is in the medulla of the brain stem and uh, it controls the vagus nerve. And we also have the enteric nervous system that supplies the esophagus. What is the nuclei for this one and what is the nuclei for that? If we're talking about the um, skeletal muscle, it's going to be the nucleus ambiguous. If we're talking about the smooth muscle, it will be dorsal motor nucleus. Okay, um, so the nucleus ambiguous is specifically for a striated muscle, remember that. And remember that it only has acetylcholine. And this is just the receptor, it's the nicotinic cholinergic receptor. Um, here we have uh, the inhibitory one works by releasing these two neurotransmitters, nitric oxide and VIP. Nitric oxide, it works by producing this second messenger called guanylocyclase, and it just causes relaxation. Uh, meanwhile, the excitatory neurons, they work not just by acetylcholine, but also substance B. So acetylcholine binds to the muscarinic cholinergic receptor, while substance B binds to um, neurokinin to receptor. This is the receptor for substance B. So this is for the vagus nerve, and this is for the enteric nervous system. Okay, remember how we said that in the upper one third, we only had contraction before the food bolus. The vagus nerve would just have contraction here while in the lower two thirds we had contraction and then relaxation after it. 
So what are the neurotransmitters that help us have this contraction and this relaxation? So for a contraction, we have acetylcholine and substance P. And for relaxation, we have VIP and nitric oxide. Uh, now, so manometry is just the test that's used to measure the pressure in the GI tract. As food enters the upper esophagus, you will have the vagal tone decreasing because you want to have an open pathway to allow the food to enter. So it will just decrease when the food enters. But then after that, when the food goes down, you'll just have an increase of tone here to push it down. And then when it comes here, you'll have an increase of tone to push it down again. So you'll just keep having increases of vagal tone to push the food down until it reaches the lower esophageal sphincter. And when it reaches the lower esophageal sphincter or the stomach, we'll know that uh, it's not skeletal muscle anymore, it's now smooth muscle. So it's going to be under the control of uh, VIP and nitric oxide. And there we can have relaxation to allow the food to enter the stomach. And as you can see here, the pressure will go down to relax, to open the sphincter, so the food can enter. Now, this was the initial peristaltic wave. But sometimes we might have a residual fluid or residual bolus or food, and we'll have to have a secondary peristaltic wave. It's as if it's going to clear it or clean it from any remnants. So this is how it's going to look like. Let's say this is the remaining food bolus. Um, if there's residue after the primary peristalsis, we need to have a secondary. So there are two ways in which we'll have a secondary peristalsis, either by central mechanism, meaning we'll have a vagal vagal reflex. Um, and this occurs if the bolus is stuck here in the skeletal muscle, in the upper striated muscle. So the reason we call it central is because it has to go back to the brain and initiate the contractions and come back. It's like a reflex. However, if the bolus of food is in the smooth muscle, it's in the lower smooth muscle, it doesn't have to go back to the brain, unlike here. So it's done by the enteric nervous system. We have a peristaltic reflex. So again, here we have a uh, central mechanism, vagal vagal reflex. Here we don't need to have, uh, we don't need to go back to the brain, um, because an interesting fact is that they call the enteric nervous system uh, the second brain. So it can operate alone. You don't have to go back to the brain. So it's right there in the GI. Uh, it can produce a secondary peristalsis uh, with the help of a reflex called peristaltic reflex, okay? So the residual bolus, if it's in the striated muscle, will have central mechanism by which reflex? Vagal vagal. Here it's by peristaltic reflex. Okay. Uh, sometimes we can have a problem with the myenteric plexus. So we could have a defect where the inhibitory, inhibitory Enteric neurons don't work. So the ones that normally release nitric oxide and VIP to allow for relaxation, they become destroyed. So we think that might be like an autoimmune disease where your immune system it thinks it's a foreign invader and it attacks them. So when there's no nitric oxide and no VIP, the lower esophageal sphincter won't relax. It will just stay closed like this. And therefore, we'll get a condition known as mega esophagus. So the esophagus gets really big and it becomes very dilated. As you can see, the lumen is getting so large and we call this condition achalasia. Again, it's an autonomic destruction of the inhibitory neurons here. So the excitatory ones are working fine because we have contraction, but the inhibitory neurons are the ones that aren't working. And you can see the lumen is super small, uh, the, sorry, the opening is super small, but the lumen is very big. Okay, so um, normally, the stomach, we know that it produces a lot of acid. We call that acid hydrochloric acid. And the tone of the lower esophageal sphincter here is very important to stop the food and to stop the acid from going up and entering the esophagus, right? Because if the food enters here, um, we will call that a reflux, gastroesophageal reflux. Or if it's a disease, it can be um, GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease. So again, when the food goes from the stomach to the esophagus, we call that gastroesophageal reflux. We don't want that to happen. Remember the function of the upper esophageal sphincter was to stop air from entering. But now the function of the lower esophageal sphincter is to stop the food and the acid from entering here, the esophagus. 
So we don't want to go from three to one. We have to have something here to close it, which is this lower is pigeon sphincter tone. And the one thing I'd like to add, the reason why um, this pressure here is very low and in the negative is because um, intrathoracic means it's in the thorax, the area where you have the lungs, right? So over there, we have a negative pressure because it's in the thorax where we're breathing, we have expansion. Um, I'll just quickly compare between positive and negative pressure. So we know that normally pressure, when it's positive, it means a compression. So you're compressing something, you're squeezing it. But when it becomes negative pressure, it's the opposite. It's like you're giving it more space to what? To expand. So you're giving it so much more space. And this makes sense because when we're breathing, our lungs are there and they're expanding. We have like a vacuum. We call that negative pressure. So that's why here it's negative. Here there's a bit of pressure already. But here it's extra, extra high because we want it to compress the opening into the stomach. We don't want anything to open. We don't want anything to go from um, three to one, from stomach to esophagus. So we have to have something really high here, really high uh, compression to um, close it. Okay. So what contributes to the tone of this lower ischial sphincter? We said that it has a very high pressure and it maintains the tone to stop any reflux. How do we get this tone? Uh, number one is because we have a tonic contraction of the circular muscle fibers over here. So because again, of the release of what neurotransmitters? Acycholine and substance P, because here we have myenteric neuron. We're in the smooth muscle. Number two is the oblique angle at which the um, esophagus and the stomach meet. So it's not straight, there's an angle to it. And it's like a flat valve. And the third reason is the crura of the diaphragm. So the crura are bands that extend from the diaphragm and they also help in pinching the lower esophagus. So this helps in closing it as well. So it's like an extrinsic uh, sphincter. And finally, we have the positive intra-abdominal pressure. Remember, we want to have uh, positive pressure so we could have compression because we want to compress this area right here. We want to close it. And uh, remember, we said negative pressure is expansion. So we have the negative pressure up here in the thorax where the lungs are. So here it's abdominal, not thoracic. So we're going to have positive pressure and therefore we'll have squeezing and compression of this sphincter right here. And that's good because we want the sphincter to be collapsed or closed up. So uh, factors that contribute to the tone, let's test ourselves. Um, oblique gastrosophageal angle forms a mucosa. What mechanism? Flap valve. Um, what part of the diaphragm? is important for um, forming a pinch cough or basically just keeping the sphincter closed. Ura, yes, it's like an external sphincter. Remember the internal sphincter is the muscle itself and the external sphincter is the diaphragm. And finally, the lower esophageal sphincter is intra, abdominal or thoracic, it's abdominal. Okay, so here it's just a repetition. Just know that the lower esophageal sphincter is active but it relaxes when the food comes, just so that the food can enter the stomach and then it contracts back again. And the smooth, smooth muscle of the lower esophagus acts as an internal sphincter to prevent the reflux. So we have an internal sphincter, which is the smooth muscle and the external one was the crude. Okay, so what are things that increase the tone of the lower esophageal sphincter even further? Number one is the positive intra-abdominal pressure. We already explained why and negative intrathoracic pressure. Again, it's because we have an expansion in the area of the lungs. We have an expansion in the thorax. And when that area expands, it will push the abdomen downward and compress it further. So we are compressing the sphincter more and closing it up. And um, one way in which you could do this, increase the intra-abdominal pressure and decrease the thoracic pressure is by coughing or also uh, in constipation. So, and even sneezing. Um, and this is good because it's like a protective mechanism for us. Uh, we don't want to have reflux when we're coughing, for example. However, a bit, uh, if you have like a very chronic cough, or if you're someone who coughs a lot or has chronic constipation, then you will have a very high intra-abdominal pressure for a long, long time. And this will damage the muscles in the long term. 
So over time, the muscles of the lower esophagus will become damaged and you will start to have reflux. So it will do the opposite of what it was supposed to do. And the, these people will suffer from GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease. Another thing um, that raises the lower esophageal sphincter tone is certain hormones. So you might have hormones like gastrin, motilin, um, also alpha adrenergic stimulation, and estrogen. The reason why gastrin will stimulate the sphincter to have more tone is because it's released when there's food and acid. Normally when we eat and start producing the acid, this hormone is released. So if you think about it, you want the sphincter to be as closed tightly as possible when there's food and acid moving around. Um, so this is also to protect us. And same thing for motilin. Motilin is a hormone that causes contraction and movement of your stomach and intestines. So if there's a lot of stomach, there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of movement, there's a chance that the things might move upwards and you might get a reflux. Uh, it's the same thing. It will close it up to protect us from having these things come back up. And alpha adrenergic stimulation, this means that you're going to have, um, alpha adrenergic stimulation means you're having sympathetic nervous system stimulation. So you know that sympathetic is fight or flight, right? Imagine if you're in a situation of fight, uh, fight or flight, like for example, you're running away from a bear. You wouldn't be relaxed. You wouldn't be eating something and you wouldn't want a reflux, obviously. So all of the sphincter will close, not just, um, not just the one in the stomach, but in general, the things where you have sympathetic nervous system, the sphincters will close. And finally, we have estrogen will also increase the tone of the lower schedule swing. So when you cough or sneeze normally, not chronically, will your lower schedule sphincter tone increase or decrease? Will increase, yes. And a uh, few hormones that, we talked about the ones that increase the tone. What about decrease? So we have secretin, glucagon, VIP, GIP, and progesterone. So uh, secretin and GIP, these hormones actually inhibit gastric acid. So unlike in this case, you won't have so much acid in your stomach. So you're not as scared from the reflux anymore. So when you've inhibited the acids, close, it's fine. The, um, the sphincter can relax a little bit. And for progesterone, um, that's why they say pregnant females are more at risk of reflux. So because this one decreases, this hormone, the progesterone, decreases the tone, so you're going to have a higher chance of reflux. Um, so what is GERD? I've been saying gastroesophageal reflux disease. Again, it's a condition where the acidic content of the stomach will uh, regurgitate back or move back into the esophagus. And why is this bad? It's because the lower es esophagus is not made for uh, for this acid. It's not glandular. So because it doesn't have glands, it can't produce a mucus to protect itself. So it can easily be damaged by this uh, acid. Okay, back to this diagram again. If the pressure in the lower esophageal sphincter, so basically number two, um, goes below 10. So if it goes below this area, for example, it comes here, it goes below three, this means that the things in the stomach will be able to move to the esophagus. Because remember, we have flow from high pressure, lower pressure. And this now became lower than the stomach. So we have higher here and lower here in the sphincter. So we will have a reflux moving from the stomach through the sphincter to the esophagus. Okay, so if that makes sense, I'll repeat. If the pressure of the lower visual sphincter goes below 10, the stomach pressure will now become higher. So it will be able to move the food from high pressure to lower pressure or from the stomach to the esophagus. And now that means that the food content will move upwards and we will get a GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease and it will damage the mucosa of the lower esophagus. So um, we said the normal uh, lower esophageal sphincter has to be between 15 and 45. It's like somewhere around here. However, if it goes below a certain number, we will get gastroesophageal reflux disease. What is that number? 10 millimeter mercury. Okay, so this is just to show you that it's a vicious cycle. 
So you have a weak lower sphingosphincter. This will cause the reflux of the acids and the food from the stomach upwards. And this will cause inflammation. And it will also cause decreased peristalsis in the esophagus because the esophagus is getting damaged. So this causes further reduction in the uh, lower esophageal sphincter function and pressure. And it just gets more and more weak. So the cycle keeps repeating again and again. Okay, so um, now let's talk about achalasia. So achalasia is an autoimmune disease that damages the, this is a repetition, we already explained achalasia, but it's an autoimmune disease that uh, attacks the inhibitory myenteric neurons. So now we can't have inhibition, we only have activation. We only have contraction. So it's going to be super, super tightly closed. And we're going to have dilation because as you eat, you're going to expand this area of the esophagus. So it widens and dilates and relaxes. And this is what it looks like. Okay, so what is the pathophysiology or how does uh, achalasia occur? So it's not confirmed, but most probably it's due to a viral infection. So you get an, a viral infection and this infection causes inflammation of the myenteric plexus. And something that could worsen it is if you have genetic susceptibility as well. And when your myenteric plexus gets damaged, either due to this infection or due to autoantibodies, meaning that person's immune system is attacking their own cells. So it's attacking this myenteric plexus. This will result in the inhibitory neurons to get destroyed. So we don't have inhibition, we only have activation. So it's going to look like this. And again, we call this achalasia or achalasia cardia. So what are the clinical features that you will see in a patient who has dysphagia? Sorry, who has achalasia? Number one is dysphagia. So dysphagia means a difficulty in swallowing. So we know that an achalasia swallowing is hard because the lower esophageal sphincter is not relaxing. So it's hard to pass the food um, into the stomach. That's number one. Number two is regurgitation. So since the food is all stuck in the throat and it can't move into the stomach, over time, it might regurgitate back up into your throat and into your oral cavity. So number two, regurgitation. Number three, retrosternal chest pain. So basically, because we have a stasis of food, meaning the food is not moving, it's just sitting there in the esophagus, this will cause a burning or squeezing sensation in your chest area. So retrosternal means behind the sternum, so in the chest area, because of the high accumulation of all the contents of food sitting there. So we have so much pressure there, and that will cause pain. So dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, regurgitation, where it basically moves backward, and pain in the chest. All right, so what are the causes of dysphagia? So this would be dysphagia, which means difficulty swallowing. Um, number one, we could have oral causes. So it could be an oral malignancy, meaning if you have a tumor um, or a cancer in your oral cavity, this will make it hard to swallow. Uh, number two, tonsillitis, which basically means inflammation of the tonsils. Uh, they're in the back of your throat. If they're inflamed, it's hard to swallow. And I think um, a lot of people experience this. And number three, if you have a viral infection, like herpes simplex virus, um, basically it's so painful that they can't even open their mouth. And um, finally, we have, uh, wait, two more. Aphthys ulceration. Aphthys ulceration is when you have ulcers in your oral mucosa. So you'll have small painful lesions or sores and they occur in your mouth maybe even in your tongue, lips, or cheeks. And these ulcers make it really difficult for you to swallow. And finally, stomatitis. When you see itis, you always know that it's inflammation. So this is an inflammation or a swelling in the mouth, which is also very painful. So these are all causes of dysphagia or uh, difficulties in swallowing. Now we could also have pharyngeal causes. Um, Number one, it could be a stroke or something that affects your brainstem. Because especially in the medulla, we have, remember, the nucleus ambiguous and the dorsal motor nucleus. These are uh, both very important for controlling swallowing. So when they're damaged, it gets very difficult for you to swallow because you have a problem in the brain. You have a problem in coordinating the whole process of swallowing. So that's the first issue. 
uh, if someone has a stroke. Uh, number two is bulbar or pseudobulbar palsy. And this just means you might get a tumor in areas that are important for speech and swallowing. And um, third reason is pharyngeal malignancy. So if you get a tumor in your pharynx, um, which could obstruct the pathway of swallowing. And then we also have myasthenia gravis. Myasthenia gravis is a condition where you have antibodies against acetylcholine receptor. So usually the acetylcholine will come and bind to the acetylcholine receptor and cause the muscle to contract. So here in myasthenia gravis, the receptors are attacked, so you don't have receptors anymore. The acetylcholine will not find anything to bind to. So now the muscles can't contract properly and you have muscle weakness. And remember, we need the muscles to contract in order to carry out the process of swallowing. And then we have motor neuron diseases. Again, uh, these muscles, when they're affected, um, you'll have a problem in the pharyngeal phase of swallowing, and you need those muscles um, to carry out the whole process. And finally, pharyngeal diverticulum. So this is a picture of what pharyngeal diverticulum looks like. Uh, it's when the mucosa, or the lining of the pharynx, is bulging out of the wall of the pharynx. So this will weaken the muscles, and for several reasons, it will cause a difficulty in swallowing. So these were the pharyngeal causes. Finally, we have esophageal causes. So it could be a problem in motility, it could be something from outside, a pressure that is extrinsic, or an intrinsic pressure. So motility disorders, we already explained what acalasia is, diffuse spasms. Some people have uh, random intense contractions, in their esophagus. And scleroderma is when you have an autoimmune disease where you get antibodies against the smooth muscles. So the smooth muscle gets damaged and it gets replaced by fibrous tissue, fibrous collagenous tissue. We call that fibrosis. So obviously you know that the collagen and the fibrous tissue can't contract and move like muscles do. So it's not going to be uh, functioning properly. So we don't want fibrous tissue, we want muscles. So scleroderma, will affect the motility of the esophagus. Um, and then we have extrinsic pressures. We could have a mediastinal mass, so uh, some sort of malignancy or tumor um, causing an obstruction, a cancer from the lungs, or uh, a dilated left atrium, because the atrium is lying behind the esophagus. So again, it could cause like an obstruction. Um, also aortic aneurysm, it's lying behind it, so it might cause an obstruction and foreign bodies and goiter. Goiter is basically enlarged thyroid gland. So if your thyroid gland enlarges so much, it could impinge or compress the esophagus and stop the pathway so you can't swallow it. And uh, these are all extrinsic pressures. What about intrinsic pressures? Um, benign and spidial strictures, strictures are basically narrowings that are not due to cancer. So this could be due to an exposure to a corrosive substance, so something like an acid or an alkaline substance. The example that the, doctor, that the doctor gave is someone ingesting acid or alkaline substances. So when they swallowed them, uh, they damaged their esophagus and they had fibrosis. Again, remember we said fibrosis is when you have um, replacement of your tissues with fibrous tissue or collagenous tissue. And this causes strictures to form the esophagus. So it's like you're damaging the tissue skin. Um, another cause is the carcinoma. Carcinoma is just cancer of the esophagus itself. So here we had cancer outside, like in the lungs, caused an obstruction. Here is the cancer of the lung itself. And finally, webs and rings. Um, this is due to B12 deficiency. So some people, when they have uh, vitamin B12 deficiency or anemia, they will get structures in the shape of thin webs and rings in their esophagus. So the mechanism is not really known, but again, this will obstruct the esophagus and you will not be able to carry out um, the process of swallowing easily. So all of these are reasons why you might have dysphagia, okay, not acclusion. I'm really sorry for this, this part. Okay. Now for salivation, we have three big salivary, salivary glands. The largest one is this one right here, the parotid gland. And this one's purely serous, meaning it doesn't produce any protein or mucus substances. It's only aqueous, so it's water and electrolytes. 
And this gland, it usually gets in, inflamed in the uh, mumps disease. You probably learned about mumps in uh, calm, which is basically, it's just basically a viral infection. So it's present next to the jaw here. So if you're trying to open your mouth, it might feel difficult, it might be painful. Um, the second gland is the sublingual gland. It's below your tongue. Lingual means tongue. So sublingual is below tongue. And finally, submandibular gland. These two glands are both mixed, meaning they produce serous and mucous saliva. But this one only produces serous, the big one. So the only one that doesn't start with an S produces serous. I don't know if that helps. But yeah. um, viscous means it's thick and sticky. So if I ever mention the word viscous, just know that means it's more, more mucus than water. So here in those two, the sublingual and submandibular, is it going to be more viscous or less, less viscous? It's going to be more viscous because here it's purely serous. This one's the one that has a bit of mucus in it. Okay, so the parotid gland. Um, oh, I want you to locate the gland. So which one's the parotid, which one's the mandibular, which one is the submandibular, which one's the sublingual? And also, what does the parotid gland secrete? And what does the sublingual and submandibular secrete? Yes, so we said the parotid gland secretes more watery or serous or non-viscous, not sticky. So it's very thin, it's filled with water and salt. Meanwhile, the sublingual and submandibular is more mucus, it's more viscous and sticky. All right. Uh, now for the production of the saliva, how does that occur? Uh, basically, we start with a structure known as the acinus. This is where the saliva is mainly produced. And when it's produced initially, it's isotonic. So isotonic means it's the same concentration as what? As plasma. So here it's isotonic to plasma. And then it goes to the intercalated duct and then to the striated duct where it gets modified. And then to the excretory duct where it leaves the... Um, the gland and exits into the oral cavity. So just to test you guys to make sure you know uh, what isotonic would mean, which of these pairs is isotonic? She said B, that's correct, because they have the same concentration. So it doesn't matter how much there is, it's just about the ratio of the solute to the solvent. Okay, so again, we said that it gets modified where? In the striated duct. So, um, Outside the acinus, okay, first, what is the primary unit that secretes the saliva? It's the acinus. And I didn't mention this yet, but what are the cells that lie around the acinus that help in the contraction in order to um, expel the saliva out? Okay, if you said myopsia cells, then that's correct. So they basically function as uh, muscles. Okay. Okay, so the doctor focused on um, the composition of the saliva after it was modified a lot. And he, he said, you guys need to know the, um, the channels that are important for the modification part. So first of all, what is the composition of saliva? We said it's hypotonic, right? Not isotonic. So initially, sorry. Maybe it go. Oh, initially, it's isotonic, so it's the same as the blood. But then it becomes hypotonic. What does that mean? It means it has a lower concentration of what? Of NaCl or sodium chloride. So it will have low sodium, low chloride, but it will have more bicarb and more potassium. Okay, so I want you to keep that in mind. It has more sodium bicarb and less sodium chloride. Oh, uh, wait, sorry, did I say so? It has more potassium bicarb and less sodium chloride, okay? So sorry, it's more potassium bicarb. So how does that occur? How does this modification occur? If we look here, this is like a zoom in of the striated uh, duct cells. This is your lumen. This is where the sal saliva is, and this is where the blood is. And uh, what happens is you have a epithelial sodium channel here. It takes the sodium from the lumen into the cell and it goes out into the blood. This process means it's being absorbed into the blood. And on the other side, we'll have the potassium coming in to the cell 
and going through the potassium channels to the lumen. So secretion of potassium and absorption of sodium, all right? So these are two things I want you to remember. Sodium absorption, potassium secretion. Second thing is chloride absorption and potassium secretion. Um, oh my God. <laughs> chloride absorption and bicarb secretion. So how does it occur? We have this uh, channel right here, which is the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator. It's going to secrete the chloride outside. The chloride will wait until there's the bicarb available to switch with it. So the bicarb, is the screen being shared? Yes, okay. So the bicarb will go outside and the chloride will go inside. So they're going to switch. This will go into the lumen, the bicarb, because remember, we want bicarb and what? And potassium. So the bicarb will go outside and the chloride will go and become absorbed into the blood. So now we have two things in the blood, sodium and chloride, and two things that are secreted into the saliva, potassium and bicarb, okay? So remember, it's high in concentration of potassium bicarb. That's why we always say that it's very alkaline, it's very basic in pH. Okay, so um, now let's test ourselves. So when the saliva is being modified, what does it absorb and what does it secrete? Remember, absorb means goes to the blood and secrete means goes to the saliva itself. So it actually absorbs sodium chloride. That's why the sodium chloride is very low in the saliva. So absorbs means it goes to the blood and out of the saliva. And secretion, we have secretion of potassium and bicarb. So that's why it's going to be high in content of saliva. Okay, and finally, it's going to be hypotonic, not isotonic. It's only isotonic initially, but then it becomes modified. All right, now rate of secretion. Why is the rate of secretion important? If the speed at which you're secreting is very, very slow, meaning you have a low rate of secretion, you're giving the, the gland more time to modify it. So the saliva is moving very slowly, slowly, slowly along, along the duct. So it's going to do this mechanism right here as much as it can, because you're giving it more time. So you're going to have so much more potassium and so much more bicarb secreted, like the typical saliva. And it's going to be hypotonic, okay? So it's very slow. So you're giving it, you're giving it more time, so it's hypotonic. On the other hand, if you're secreting very fast, you have a high rate, you're not giving it any time to catch up. So low time or less time for modification, and it's not going to be hypotonic as much as saliva usually is. Instead, it's going to be closer to isotonic. It's going to be like the plasma or like the primary secretion. So when you initially secreted it, it was isotonic, so, so it's going to be similar to that concentration. Why? Because we don't have enough time for modification. Okay, so the degree of hypotonicity and the electrolyte composition are dependent on the rate of secretion. When your rate increases and you become uh, and you secrete it faster and faster, the osmolality increases. So here it's very hypotonic. Here it's moving towards isotonic. Okay, so the osmolality keeps increasing to become more isotonic, just like the plasma. Um, and this graph is trying to show you how to compare what this level would be like in different rates. So I'm going to compare this spot here, um, like in the beginning of the graph, and this one right here. If it's very slow, meaning it has a low rate of secretion, the amount of sodium, see this line leads to sodium, and the amount of chloride will be very low. Unlike the plasma. Look at the plasma, the sodium chloride is very high. Because here, when you're secreting slowly, the saliva will have a very low NaCl. Why? because it's modifying it as much as possible. Remember, you're giving it more time for modification. So more and more hypotonicity. It's going to be lower in concentration. Because if you speed up the secretion and have a really high rate of secretion, what's going to happen? You won't modify it as much. You won't be able to absorb NaCl. They'll stay in the saliva. So you will have a high Na and high Cl concentration. And that's gonna be closer to the plasma concentration. I hope that makes sense. And for the chloride, uh, sorry, why do I keep saying chloride? For the potassium, uh, when you secrete faster, 
you're not giving your um salivary glands enough time to absorb, sorry, to secrete that potassium. So you're going to have less and less potassium in the saliva. So let me go back here. Yes, normally you want to secrete potassium in the lumen. You want to have a really high amount of potassium here in the saliva. Just because they're secreting really fast, there's not going to be enough potassium here. Okay, the, so the potassium will decrease. As you can see here, the potassium will decrease when you're secreting faster. So as the rate of secretion increases, potassium decreases. The only thing is the bicarb doesn't change. It just keeps increasing the more, the more you secrete. Because bicarb is the main thing um, or the main component of saliva. So it doesn't matter the rate as much when you're talking about bicarb. So basically the whole idea of this whole graph and this whole slide is the faster the rate of secretion, the closer the concentration of the saliva to plasma or the more isotonic it is. So it's going to resemble plasma or it's going to resemble the initial secretion. Why? Because you don't have time to modify it. Okay. Now, how do we stimulate salivary secretion? We can either stimulate it by sympathetic stimulation or by parasympathetic stimulation. By sympathetic stimulation, it's through the superior cervical ganglion, T1 to T3. By parasympathetic, it can be two options, depending on which gland. So remember how the parotid gland is the largest salivary gland? So remember that it has the bigger number. So cranial nerve seven and nine, nine is bigger. So the nine will go to the parotid gland. This is not um, scientific. Again, it's just like a mnemonic or a way to remember it. So cranial nerve nine, glossopharyngeal command. It's a very long word compared to facial, but they will be going to the parotid gland. Meanwhile, the submandibular and sublingual are a bit smaller. So they will be supplied by cranial nerve seven, the facial nerve. Okay. And the main function for salivary secretion, secretion is parasympathetic. So yes, sympathetic is a component. However, the main one is the parasympathetic. We really want that parasympathetic stimulation. Otherwise, the sympathetic will be um, lower in amount. So it's not going to be as much saliva and command is going to be thicker, more viscous or uh, protein, filled with protein. And uh, a silly way to remember it is sympathetic is filled with protein, so SP, parasympathetic, is filled with salt and water, so PS. So SP, PS. Sympathetic, it's protein, it's viscous, it's thick. Parasympathetic, it's more uh, water and salt, it's thin, and it's high in amount, it's copious. Okay, oh, so here it is, SP, PS. And the neurotransmitter for the sympathetic is norepinephrine. For the parasympathetic stimulation, the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. And you need to know what they work why? So what are the second messengers? Norepinephrine will increase IP3 and lead to an increase in calcium. And the calcium will lead to the um, exocytosis of these granules. So you'll basically have granules that contain enzymes that contain mucin. And when the calcium binds to them, they become exocytosed. They will be pushed out of the cell. So this is the picture that basically shows the granules. Calcium will come and bind to them so that they can be exocytosed. So this is for sympathetic. Remember, sympathetic protein or enzymes. Parasympathetic, it's more salt and water. It's more thin. It works by acetylcholine, which increases cyclic AMP. And now I'm going to test you guys. Um, parasympathetic. So which neurotransmitter does it work by? Acetylcholine or norepinephrine? Acetylcholine, yes. Is it um, for sympathetic? Okay, I think I kind of revealed that. It's norepinephrine. Um, type. Acetylcholine, what is the second messenger that it works by? The answer is calcium. And for norepinephrine, the answer is cyclic AMP. Like, what is the dominant influence? Is it parasympathetic or sympathetic? The answer is parasympathetic, okay? So this is kind of repetition of what we already said. We said in the cranial nerve uh, seven and nine. Remember, nine is for which one? For the parotid gland, which is the larger one. The cranial nerve seven is for the submandibular and sublingual. And this is for sympathetic. Parasympathetic, it's by the um, superior cervical ganglion. So, yes, uh, T1, T3. Okay. And it works by norepinephrine. So now they're introducing to you a drug 
known as atropine. Atropine is a drug that works to inhibit uh, cholinergic receptors. What it does is basically it takes the seeds of the receptor. So wait, let me show you this picture. So, okay, usually acetylcholine will come and bind to the receptor and does it, it does its job. So contraction, whatever it's going to happen. It's when atropine comes, it takes it instead. It's like it sits in the seat of acetylcholine. So now acetylcholine cannot bind. So it's like a competitive inhibitor of acetylcholine. And you won't have the functions of acetylcholine. Remember, acetylcholine is important for the parasympathetic aspect of salivary secretion. So with atropine, you're going to inhibit this whole part. So what's left? The sympathetic part. And remember, the sympathetic part, we said it's more proteinaceous, it's more thick and viscous. And command, it's not as much. It's going to be very little um, uh, amount of uh, saliva. Okay, so this is the mechanism of action of atropine. Okay, now for the components of saliva. Saliva has so many components. We have enzymes, antimicrobials, mucin, haptocorin. Let's start with enzymes. It has alpha amylase, which is basically an enzyme that breaks down or digests starch. And remember that it doesn't completely break down any carbohydrates. It just helps in the initiation of the breakdown so that it makes the job easier later on. And then we have lingual lipase, which is um, A's breaking down lipids. So it breaks down lipids, lipase. And this lipid digestion is specifically important for newborns or infants because they are the ones that completely depend on lipid digestion. They only have milk, so they need to digest the lipid in the milk and they need this enzyme um, the most. And then we have antimicrobials, which are things that fight the microorganisms like bacteria, for example. Number one, we have lactoferrin. Lactoferrin is something that binds to iron and some bacteria and some microorganisms, they need this iron to survive. They eat this iron basically. But when you bind to this iron, you're depriving the microorganisms of that iron, so they can't survive without it. Uh, number two, we have lysozymes. Lysozymes will break down the cell wall of the bacteria, so it's going to kill the bacteria because the cell wall is made up of sugar in the bacteria or peptidoglycan. The lysozyme will come and break that down. And finally, we have um, lactoperoxidases. Lactoperoxidases, they work by using hydrogen peroxide and it will also destroy the bacterial uh, membranes. So it's bactericidal, meaning it kills bacteria. And we also have mucin, which is important for having the viscosity, the thickness of the uh, saliva. Okay, so this mucin is very important for having the thick and viscous saliva because you also need lubrication. Lubrication means you're decreasing the friction as much as possible. So imagine you're swallowing or you're chewing you don't want it to be completely dry. You have to have some sort of um, lubricant, something to make it smooth and easier so you don't damage your mucosa. And finally, we have haptocorin. Haptocorin is a, a substance that binds to vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 is also called uh, cobalamin, and it's an important cofactor. So you need this cofactor in growth. You need it when you're synthesizing DNA. Um, let's say, for example, you have an injury and uh, you need to heal the tissues. So when you need to heal the tissues, you replace them with other cells. And uh, The process of cell division needs DNA synthesis and needs vitamin B12. So if you don't have vitamin B12, you will have a problem with wound healing. You might have um, also a deficiency in uh, growth factor. So haptocorin is important for binding B12, vitamin B12. Otherwise, it will get degraded in the stomach. So the haptocorin, it's like it's keeping the vitamin B12 safe as it goes through the stomach. And again, it's important for wound healing and for uh, DNA synthesis. So if you have a deficiency, you might have something like anemia, for example. Okay, so what are the uh, components of saliva? We said enzymes, antimicrobials, mucins, and something else, I'm not going to say that now. So first of all, what does amylase digest? carbohydrates or starch. And what does lipase digest? Lipids, it's more important in newborns. And uh, lactoferrin binds to what? Iron, I realize it's also written here, the same, uh, lysozymes, 
hydrolyzes the components of bacterial cell wall. And finally, lactoperoxidase oxidizes various substances by hydrogen peroxide. So, mucin is important because viscosity. And uh, finally, we have the thing that binds to vitamin B12 is aptocorn. Okay. And uh, these are just the functions of saliva. Um, it's important for helping you speak. Obviously, you have to, when you have a dry mouth, it will be difficult to speak. So the, the name for a dry mouth is xerostomia. And it's also important for antimicrobial actions. Remember, we already explained it has lysozymes, it has uh, lactoferrin, it has lactoperoxidase. Uh, it also prevents the breakdown of enamel. Enamel is just the layer over your teeth that protects um, protects us from cavities. This probably gives you like calm flashbacks, but basically this enamel is important for protecting you from caries. But when you have a dry mouth, you're at a higher chance of having caries. That's why saliva is really important for protecting your teeth. Um, it also maintains hydration, prevents abrasion. Again, remember we said without the saliva, there would be too much friction. So this is between meals. During the meal, during meals or during the process of eating, it's important for making uh, chewing easier and following is easier. Again, lubrication. Um, it's high in pH. It's very basic or alkaline. So it's going to buffer any ingested acids uh, or even any reflux that comes from the stomach. Uh, it dilutes hot solutions. So it spreads it around so you don't get burned if you eat something really hot. And it solubilizes food and it breaks it down. So it increases the surface area so that you could taste it more. So higher taste bud sensitivity because of solubilization. And finally, it digests starch and uh, lipids. We said lingual lipase and amylase. Okay, so salivary output. Remember we said that sympathetic is going to cause it to have low amount of saliva. I mean, sympathetic does not produce a high amount and it's more protein rich, while parasympathetic produces a lot of saliva, but it's protein poor. So let's say you decrease or you remove the whole sympathetic part, what's going to happen to the salivary output is going to be um, minimal, yani minimal effect, sorry. So basically you're not going to be affected as much. So if you remove the sympathetic component, there's a minimal effect, you won't be harmed because you still have all of this major part. This if you take it the other way around and you remove the parasympathetic part, you will decrease secretion significantly because this was the main part that you were depending on. This part is not so much. Okay, now let's try to test ourselves. So the salivary output sympathetic, scant, meaning it's low, and for parasympathetic, scopies, meaning it's high in number. Um, the time course is transient, meaning it comes and goes, but parasympathetic, it's continuous, it's sustained. For composition, uh, sympathetic is more protein rich, parasympathetic is more electrolytes in water or protein poor. And finally, if you have denervation of the sympathetic, what's going to happen? Minimal effect, you won't be affected because you have this part. Because for parasympathetic, you're going to have a huge effect. You will have a decreased secretion and glandular atrophy. Your gland will die because. Um, not die, sorry, will get weakened because the main supply of it was the parasympathetic. Right? Um, so that's it. Thank you guys so much. Um, I hope it was clear. If you have any questions, please send me. Um, Marlish, if the last part was just, this, uh, please send me if you have any concerns. And um, thank you guys.